This is the Comics Alternative Election Week Special, a roundtable discussion on political comics. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Specials. I'm Derek. And I'm Gene. And we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. That's right. And on this episode, Gene and I have the pleasure of talking with Richard Graham, Frederick Stromberg, Raphael Medoff, and Kent Worcester about political and propaganda comics. But before we get to that conversation, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off at the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off of the cover price. Sometimes as much as 50% off. But many times, you can find discounts that go higher than that. And we got tons of bundles at Discount Comic Book Service this month. Uh, November sees DC Kids bundles, Marvel Kids bundles, uh, DC Universe Rebirth bundles, several of them. Young Animal, I'm reading some of those books right now already. Those are, those are a lot of fun. Uh, even a Marvel Star Wars bundle. More bundles than you can shake a stick at. That's right. And if you got a shake to stick, then definitely shake it on over at Discount Comic Book Service. Their website is dcbservice.com. Go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your books there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. ka <laughs> You know, Gene, this roundtable has been a long time in coming, and you and I have been talking about this with Richard, Frederick, Raphael, and Kent for a little more than a year. Oh, don't even say that. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it was – this is this is what happens when we do roundtables. When you bring on a good number of people, you have to coordinate the times. And, you know, Frederick's over there in Sweden, so we had to deal with time issues. But we were able to bring this about, so that's great. Yeah, trying to, try, try to juggle six different – because they're not just juggling four schedules. They're juggling six schedules. Right. And so there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that need to be – there's a lot of phases and issues, man. But uh, I'm glad we got it together. Yes. And, you know, we should um, say a special hello, thank you, or definitely a shout out to our friend Craig Yo. Because friend even of the though podcast. He, that's right. Friend of the podcast. Even though he's not a part of this conversation, he's, I guess you could say, the genesis of this roundtable discussion. Because, uh, you know, he was talking with us one time when you and I were interviewing him, and he had mentioned this book that he did with Raphael Medoff, Cartoonists Against the Holocaust, and wanting to. To know if we wanted to review it or discuss it with Raphael in any way. And we thought, you know, it would be great to do a roundtable on political and propaganda cartoons. And it just, the idea grew from there. And, you know, in a way, I'm glad it took us so long to get to this because when this episode goes up, it's going to be Monday, November 7th, the day before the 2016 elections in the United States. Yeah, so politics a little, little uppermost in the consciousness right now. That's right. We even talk about the current uh, political atmosphere in terms of cartoons, although not that much because what uh, Frederick, Richard, Raphael, and Kent are primarily concerned with is or, or more historically based. Although I guess the books of Richard and uh, Kent deal with some very contemporary comics as well. Yeah, Kent, Kent especially, since it's, it's pretty much. Uh, most of the interviews that have been conducted in the past, what, 10 years or uh, 10, 15 years. And so there's a lot of more contemporary stuff in, in Kent's book. But, I mean, it's, it's a, we cover a wide variety of uh, countries, types of cartooning, subject matter. It, it's, it's, it's a wide-ranging panel. Well, let's go ahead and get to that roundtable discussion. <laughs> 
We're pleased to have as our guest on this roundtable Richard Graham. He's an associate professor and media librarian for the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. His book, Government Issue, Comics for the People, 1940s to 2000s, was published in 2011. Frederick Stromberg, he is a Ph.D. candidate at Malmo University, and he's an author of a number of books that deals with political cartooning, one of which is Comic Art Propaganda, A Graphic History, and that came out in 2010. Uh, we're also joined by Raphael Medoff. He is the founding director of the David Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies in Washington, the author of over 15 books about Jewish history and the Holocaust, and one of those books, Cartoonists Against the Holocaust, he completed last year with friend of the show, Craig Yo. And then also joining us is Kent Worcester. He is a professor of political science at Marymount Manhattan College, and he is the author of Peter Cooper Conversations, very political uh, collection of uh, interviews, as well as a book that was just released this year, Silent Agitators, Cartoon Art from the Pages of New Politics. Guys, welcome to the Comics Alternative. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know that this is a conversation that we've been in t touch and talking about for quite a while, and I'm glad that you know coordinating people's schedules sometimes can be a challenge, but I'm glad we were able to do this uh, right before the 2016 presidential election because all of you have w written extensively on political cartooning and propaganda cartoons, and so I think it's an appropriate time for this. Um, but but let's let's begin by talking about your individual works, and and I'm curious, I mean, what is it about political comics that drew you to your you know respective works, or, or maybe another way of um, of asking this question is. Do you think that political cartoons seem to get uh, significantly less attention than other kinds of comic art? Is that an open question to everyone? Or? <laughs> sure, yeah. just jump in the water. <laughs> All right. Well, for me, uh, comics that try to persuade you of something have always interested me. Um, uh, when you start thinking about it, you realize that all of them are trying to persuade you of something. But... Uh, and, and I do agree uh, at some level that they haven't been studied enough. Uh, and when I started studying, studying them, there were very little to read about this subject. So uh, I think I, I just wanted to fill out the gaps in, in the history of, of comics, really. I have a was, back... It was Frederick, <clears throat> by the way. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is Richard, and I just wanted to say that I, I have a background in instructional design and um, I was interested in the comics that the government put out because the University of Nebraska is a federal government depository, which meant that we practically have to keep everything that the government spit out, including <laughs> these sort of oddball comics, which dovetailed nicely with this idea of using graphics and words uh, to instruct or cause a change in behavior. Um, and then that source of, you know, sort of there's a kind of confusion between advertising and education and propaganda, which... I think is ripe for plenty of discussion and investigation. My background may be a little different. I always uh, separated my professional life from my interest in comics. Uh, I became interested in comics when I was doing field research in England on the Thatcher government. And um, I lived uh, in a, a flat with some people who were interested in comics. And so the, the comics I was exposed to were mostly sort of indie comics and superheroes. And for about, um, I don't know, 20 years, I wrote on comics for the Comics Journal, but never wrote for a political science audience or thought of political comics as, or political cartooning as something I was interested in. But then more recently, I began to be really interested in the um, uh, distinction between short form and long form cartooning. And my sense is that much of the literature focuses on longer works as part of an effort to establish the credibility of comic studies. Mm -hmm. And I guess I went in the opposite direction and became uh, fascinated by, you know, the shortest possible kind of cartooning, the, not only the single image or a single panel, but just the, you know, the, the, the way in which just a, a tiny number of lines can make a political statement. So I did finally come out of the closet, as it were, with my <laughs> colleagues, and now everybody knows I do comics. But um, 
<laughs> I still think that um, political cartooning is understudied compared to, say, superheroes or uh, indie alternative comics. Oh, absolutely. You know, that's, that's especially true among um, historians who study the Holocaust. This is Raphael. In, um, in, in looking at the Holocaust, the idea that political cartoons – have any uh, relevance is completely new. Now, this is mm. ironic because there's there have been a number of fine studies of how American newspapers reported the Holocaust, um, and those studies have covered news coverage and editorials. Uh, but for some reason, when they got to the the place on the editorial page where the cartoon appeared, historians looked the other way. So as I began my research on political cartoonists in the American press who were commenting on the Holocaust, um, I found myself in a brand new area, uncharted territory. That's very interesting. So each of you in a variety of ways have been filling in gaps in the criticism and scholarship when, when it comes to, to, I guess, comic art. Um, now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, Raphael, uh, your book, a Cartoonist Against the Holocaust, came out last year, and you did this with, with Craig Yeo. Uh, you know, that, that man just never ceases to surprise me. I mean, he has all of these connections. He seems to know everyone. I mean, I'm curious, how did this project on the Holocaust cartoons come about? You know, I, Craig and I like to joke that we're sort of a – a modern version of a comic book team up. He's a he's a historian of comics. I'm a historian of the Holocaust. So we came to this subject matter with two completely different backgrounds, um, but we found it to be the perfect combination. It came about because my focus in studying the Holocaust is how America and Americans responded to the news of the mass murder of the Jews in Europe, and and my my particular area of specialty is those who did speak out, which is to say that when you study America's response to the Holocaust, most of that is the sad story of America abandoning um, the Jews in Europe. But I, I have written and researched a great deal about the minority of Americans in different walks of life, journalists, members of Congress, and others who did speak out, who tried to protest in different ways, who tried to alert the American public about what was going on and try to make the case that there was something that the United States government could do to help Jewish refugees. So in looking at at that side of the story, looking for the, the few people who did raise their voices, um, I, I came across a, a, occasionally a political cartoon in you know in the microfilms of old newspapers that I was coming, combing through for other reasons. And I was struck by the fact that that every once in a while, not often, but every once in a while, there was a political cartoonist and sometimes one of, of renown, um, Dr. Seuss in the New York City newspaper PM or uh, Herbert Block, Herb Block as he was known in the Washington Post. Every once in a while, one of these cartoonists would use his pen to try to raise public awareness about the Jewish refugee uh, crisis. And that, that intrigued me. When I first met um, Craig Yo at a comic convention some years back, um, he asked me, are there enough of these that it's, was it really a historical phenomenon? Could they fill a book, for example? And at that point, I didn't think so because I'd only come across perhaps a dozen of them over the years in the course of my research. But then um, at his, with his encouragement, I began looking at – um, old new, these old newspapers for cartoons uh, in earnest and un unfortunately very as far as I know or certainly at that time relatively few of the newspapers I was looking at were digitalized so this was very old fashioned research going to university libraries and, and looking at old microfilm something mm -hmm. that my my kids, for example, can't understand at all the concept of, of a microfilm. <laughs> Thank uh, you, by the way. Thank you for yeah. doing that. <laughs> but but then that's where I started finding more of these, and, and there aren't that many in the end. But but we found uh, between Craig and I, we found ultimately close to two hundred, and that's what that's what the book "Cartoonist Against the Holocaust" says. It brings together um, about one hundred and fifty of these cartoons, the ones that that particularly. Um, illustrate uh, what was happening to the Jews in Europe. So in, in the book is kind of a way for 
um, a way for today's reader to look at the Holocaust, but through the eyes of cartoons that appeared in the 1930s and 1940s. I, I love the kind of origin story that you gave there for for the project. I mean, what I like about that book especially is that in all these books, they're not just like a collection of cartoons, but you really give kind of a historical context for all the stuff. I mean, the cartoons against the Holocaust, it's kind of like a history of the Holocaust told through these cartoons with, with what, 30, there's like 30 some chapters or something? It's Exactly, 42 chapters. Each chapter features um, cartoons pertaining to a particular aspect of the Holocaust. So it goes chronologically. We start with the rise right. of Hitler in 1933, and you see how American cartoonists um, depicted that, and it goes all the way until the end of the war in 1945. I, I just want to add here, as origin stories go, I wish I had something a little more exciting, like one of us being hit by, you know, something <laughs> radioactive or something a little bit like that. But anyway, um, what I'm finding already um, is that among um, in the comics world, um, comic conventions that Craig and I have been speaking at, um, people are, are are very are very pleased and surprised to hear that political cartoonists that, that cartoonists took an interest in the subject at all. So it's a um, it, it's been an interesting um, experience showing this side of comics and cartoon history to the world of comics fandom where where this work was not really known. Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, uh, Richard, uh, you, uh, in, in the introduction to your book, uh, uh, Government Issue, you talk a little bit about uh, you were looking for a research focus as an academic librarian, or if you could talk a little, about, a little bit about that. I have a vested interest in that one myself. <laughs> well, <clears throat> for better or for worse, the University of Nebraska has a tenure-track system um, and faculty status for librarians, uh, which means there's an expectation for uh, producing research and participating in the academic conversation of a topic or area. And, um, you know, it was sort of a perfect storm in terms of combining a research interest because as a librarian, you know, people say that's a liberal artist or my dad would say a dilettante, but you get to know a little <laughs> bit about everything. We're sort of kids of the candy store here. Um, and as it turned out, uh, my interest in education sort of coincided with when Ethan Persoff started posting sort of those weird oddball comics online. Uh, including, uh, I remember including a government document which sent me into our stacks where, uh, incidentally, I found the first comic I ever read as a kid, which when I was an army brat growing up in Darmstadt, Germany, my father handed me an army manual and I didn't expect to see that again 20 years later. But <laughs> yeah, that sort of turned into an aha moment, which is that comic scholarship is multidisciplinary and it's emerging. Amen. And uh, it, it resonates very much with students today because it's visual. Um, you know, the too long didn't read generation, I suppose, but in, in, it really, we are more of a visual culture, it seems, but yeah, uh, culture, uh, comic studies seemed a, a right fit for me. And as a librarian, I saw a role in terms of collecting and archiving and sort of making available for others, sort of the theorists out there, uh, these sort of materials that weren't collected before. So that's why I started hosting these online databases that collected government comics, educational comics. And I have a pretty good collection right now of comic books that were produced during election times. Um, that'll probably be going online in about a month or so once the proper metadata is available. Uh, so, so I was able to, uh, you know, again, I was able to kind of harness uh, this emerging scholarship of, of, of comic studies and kind of, you know, take a shot at it and participate in it. I have a kind of a minor question. Are those kind of government comics, are they copyrighted or can anybody reproduce them, post them online? So, um, well, that's a great question, and I've run into that a couple of times because of subcontracting issues. But um, as many of you may know, uh, typically anything the government printing office puts out is in the public domain, ah. with two noted exceptions, uh, which is called the Smokey Bear Rule, because... <laughs> Smoky Bear, and it, and by the way, it's Smoky Bear. I, you know, I've been at parties where I was corrected. It's not manga; it's manga, but it's also <laughs> it's Smoky Bear, not Smoky the Bear. But Smoky Bear was so popular that uh, Dell Comics and Gold Key were producing their own uh, royalty free, of course. But there was also that subsidiary, um, those ephemeral things like ashtrays. You had Smoky Bear lighters. Um, where the government recognized that this was a brand uh, that they had to reel in. 
So they took uh, Smokey Bear out of the public domain. Woodsy Owl is also out of the public domain. <laughs> and uh, in, believe it or not, there is an actual government document pamphlet that describes to you the proper ways to destroy a Smokey Bear and Woodsy Owl costume. Because you cannot allow that, <laughs> you cannot allow that to get into enemy hands. Um, and I think this sort of relates to what we're kind of talking about, which is the power of the visual image or whatnot. But uh, Smokey Bear is so iconographic that if a business were to get a hold of a secondhand costume, right? We're talking about degrading the brand. We're talking about straying from its intents and purposes. The sort of things that Walt Disney sues people left and right for. So as you can believe it, the, for the most part, yes. Everything the government printing office puts out is in the public domain, with the exception of Smokey Bear and Woodsy Owl. They did do subcontracting with people like Hank Ketchum to do Dennis Menace, the Menace stuff, uh, Al Cap, let them use Little Abner. Um, and, but that was subcontracted work for hire, which meant that while they still owned Little Abner, that comic where he entices you to join the Navy um, is not. So... Uh, and under fair use, I've posted that online, and I've only had one or two questions from uh, a company out of Washington, D.C., that still does the occasional subcontracting. His name is Scott Deshane, and it's it's not commercial comics because that was Malcolm Mater's uh, uh, outfit from the 50s, but uh, it's something similar that kind of creates these educational comics sort of on demand. But otherwise, yeah, they're in the public domain and they're available to download and remix or read for your own leasure. Hmm. That, 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 that true story of Smokey Bear, of, of Smokey Bear comic, that is, that's the first comic book I ever read. Uh, really? And, and, <clears throat> and, I, and I still have my copy. <laughs> that, 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 that picture of, of little Smokey the cub with his fur burned off has been seared into my brain. I can never unsee that image. You sure it's not Smokey Cub? No, I, I think smoking. I know what he's talking about. And there's also a Spanish version of that, incidentally, um, which is also interesting when the government puts out uh, certain comics where they just superimpose and say they just swap out the language with Spanish, uh, expecting uh, that to resonate with certain communities or whatever. <laughs> so that's, a, that's another discussion, too. Well, let me ask all of you on this topic of uh, permission rights um, and, and what problems they may, may pose. Um, I mean, all of us do work in comic studies, and so all of us are very familiar with the headaches that go along with trying to get permissions to reproduce issue, uh, images from at least some owners. Um, is it um, a little better when you're dealing with uh, political cartoons than it is with, let's say, non-political cartoons such as comic books, graphic novels? I, I would say my experience is that there's three kinds of copyright holders. Uh, artists and writers themselves tend to be very generous as long as you're able to offer something. Um, you know, uh, when we put together Jeet uh, here, Charles Hatfield and I put together a superhero reader, we approached Gloria Steinem or her assistant to reprint her essay on uh, Wonder Woman, and she was delighted, and for some very modest fee, she gave us the permission. Um, so those are the easiest people often to work with. Uh, estates, of course, are famously difficult mm -hmm. and can range from people who, you know, say family members or whatever who are indifferent to rights holders who have inherited the rights. Uh, Wortham's um, uh, um, Seduction of the Innocent is now, I believe, uh, the rights have gone to Harvard. So you have to go through Harvard to reprint Wortham. But the single most difficult group of rights holders to deal with are the big corporations, the um, Taylor and Francis and, you know, other um, companies. Walt Disney. Uh, right. And, you know, they're, they're, they, it's very hard to convince certain right holders that there's a meaningful distinction between a small press, university press type uh, endeavor and a commercial one. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that problem is going to get harder over time rather than easier. In Europe, it's the inheritors of the rights to Hergé's Tintin, which are the most troublesome to talk to. Right. <laughs> But is there something a little easier or, or maybe not so much easier in, in getting permission to reproduce, uh, let's say, one panel political strips uh, or political cartoons as opposed to, to more involved narrative type of comics? Actually, in Sweden, it's, it's the, quite the opposite because uh, you're allowed to, to reproduce, uh, according to Swedish law, parts uh, of an art 
artwork, but not the whole artwork. So if it's three panels from a graphic novel, that's fine. But if it's a uh, political cartoon, which is just one panel, then you can't reproduce that. So uh, rather the opposite, I would say. Hmm. And I think we all agree that there's no point in writing about comics if you can't provide readers with visuals. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. I had to deal with the Walt Disney Company um, to secure reproduction rights. Um, what was interesting about that was that the very basis of that of those images, which was the Gremlins, was Walt Disney ripping off a story he did with Raoul Dahl for the Royal Air Force. <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, you know, seventy five years later, um, at a time when you had artists uh, donating their time and effort and talents, like Milton Kniff, um, and of course Eisner, and of course the Eisner estate, wonderful to work with, wonderful people who get it. Um, but yeah, with Disney. Um, uh, I had to pay quite heavily for uh, for for images that they had, you know, essentially charged the government for seventy five years or you know earlier. So uh, that was disappointing because, as was mentioned earlier, they just didn't quite understand the uh, intent of of an academic trying to uh, make this information out there and make everyone aware versus a, a commercial effort. Yeah. Frederick, in your book, in 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 the in the comic art propaganda, you made a made a point of dealing with, as you said, long form comics rather than single panels. Was it, was the copyright part of that, or was you're just more interested in kind of a, a argumentative propaganda rather than just kind of images? It's more more a case of of uh, my interest, but it was also that that book was written uh, in a very very short period of time, and I had to uh, secure the rights and, and get all the images, write all the texts. I basically I did the whole book in three months. So wow, <laughs> that, that was quick. So if some <laughs> something an image wasn't available, I just skipped it and and went on writing the book. So so uh, it was a case of me what I was interested in and what was available really. Well, you know, all all of you are dealing in your in your books with political cartoons that touch upon sometimes lightly, sometimes not so lightly, uh, stereotypes and caricatures. And I know that Frederick, you know, you've done two books that that relate to this: black images in comics, and then Jewish images in comics. Um, in compiling the various political and propaganda cartoons is, that you guys have been coming across over the years, um, in have uh, any decisions about what to include in the book? Uh, were those based on I don't know certain sensibilities, maybe even your own about certain images potentially being offensive, or maybe because they were so offensive you wanted to include them and specifically wanted to include them uh, to prove a point? Well, when I did the Black Images book, I was very naive and I was Swedish, so I didn't realize that there was going to be a big ruha about it. Um, so I did, I did it in Swedish at first, uh, and that was much smaller. And I sent it to Fanographics, and they said, fine, we'll publish that. And I realized, shit, I have to add <laughs> you know, twice the amount of, of examples to make sure that I cover all angles and that I'm, I'm not come over as, as totally ignorant to, to uh, what's going on in America and, and racism and everything like that. And still, I was invited to, to San Diego Comic Con, and they put me on as... Uh, an, a scholar uh, talk uh, with an opponent uh, and a room full of like 200 black people. Uh, that was scary. So I would say that what I included was very much chosen for uh, me thinking of the audience, but I didn't exclude anything for it being offensive. Rather, I included it because I, I, the book was all about showing how offensive comics had been so mm -hmm. I have a related story there's a mid-century cartoonist named uh, Jesse Cohen who published under the name Carlo who I think is a wonderful cartoonist and and essentially um, very little written about because he wrote for a very um, sort of obscure left-wing newspaper uh, for a while, his editor in uh, during World War II, before he's uh, shipped off, was Irving Howe. The paper was called Labor Action. And um, I've reprinted a bunch of Carlo's images. Um, his estate basically died with him. Um, and nobody knows what happened to his original uh, cartoon art. Um, but when I was uh, in England last summer, 
I stumbled across a, um, a little left-wing book um, called, I believe, uh, On War and Revolution, which uh, contains uh, hundreds of Carlo's cartoons. It's, it looks like it's comprehensive. And I would say two or three of those cartoons includes the N-word. And I really thought about, boy, I would not have reprinted those cartoons, even though they were intended at the time as anti-racist cartoons. They were cartoons that, of course, um, depicted Southern uh, Jim Crow, pro-Jim Crow politicians. Um, but I personally wouldn't want my name on the book or a, or a journal article with cartoons that 60 or 70 years ago, people intended to be, um, you know, as progressive as possible. Well, well in, looking at, in looking at cartoons about the Holocaust, um, we did encounter a problem along these lines. Now, a lot of the cartoons obviously depict uh, Germans, let's say Nazis, Hitler and others, um, as, uh, you know, beasts, as uh, apes. Um, some, sometimes they look kind of like Frankenstein. We didn't have a problem with those. They, we didn't consider those to be racially motivated. They weren't anti-German per se, but they were a way of dramatizing, you know, the beastly behavior of, of the Germans. So I didn't, we didn't have a problem with that. But a few of the cartoons that we were considering for inclusion in the book depicted not only German leaders, but also they would throw in um, the Japanese leaders, um, mm -hmm. let's say La Hirohito. And there, as you, as you know, um, the, it was common for political cartoonists in those days to draw, um, to draw Japanese leaders with very exaggerated, racist, um, what they considered to be Asian features. And there was one in particular that Craig and I kind of wrestled with, and what we decided – ultimately was to include the cartoon, um, but to explain in the caption that this was a common um, a, a, a phenomenon um, in that day of how, ja how Japanese or Asians were often depicted. Um, so we felt that was, the, that was the appropriate solution. Included, it was part of history, um, but just explain it so that, you know, a teenager looking at the book and seeing um, the, the emperor of Japan depicted with, you know, with giant teeth and all that. Um, so you understand, OK, that's that's how they did it. It wasn't right. Um, but we Craig and I didn't want to just, you know, white it out of the history book, so to speak. Hmm. I was I was going to say that for my book, Black Images, uh, that was done together with the late, great Kim Thompson, which who was my, my editor, and uh, he suggested at first that the book was going to be called From Cartoon Coons to the Boondocks, Boondocks being a big thing at the time. And uh, I didn't have uh, a clue about if that was a good title or not. He was the editor. And then he came back, came, then he came back to me saying that the, um, the distributors said they wouldn't touch a book which had the word coon in the title. <laughs> Therefore, we, we went for the more sedate black images in the comics. Uh, I think I remember that. I think I remember hearing about it under that first title, also. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, in 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 your case, Frederick, you know, you take out those offensive images from both black images in history or in comics, and then Jewish images in comics, and, and you don't have much of a book, right? Uh, because yeah. you know they're they're really built on that. And, and we should mention that in black images in the comics, one of uh, the pieces that you include is by, of course, comics great uh, Will Eisner, his image of Ebony White. Mm, there yeah. you go. Yeah. I have a, an image in my book that Will Eisner did for Army Motors uh, using caricature for, for African Americans uh, as well, and including the Milton Kniff uh, a little instructional booklet on how to tell the difference between a person from China and a person from Japan. That was, I think, uh, so racist that even the army didn't repub reprint it the next year in their in their little handbook. Wow! But I, I think when you are doing a history, I think when you see like something that makes you cringe um, or like, yeesh, I wish Milton Kniff hadn't drawn that or Will Eisner did that. Um, but we have an obligation to show warts and all, and um, uh, and I think Eisner even addressed uh, his uh, portraiture of African Americans later in life. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, I think there's an obligation to, to show it all. Um, and, uh, I mean, that is the history of it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quibble with that if I can. Um, I think that's absolutely right if you're talking about in the context of, say, a monograph on somebody's career 
um, an in-depth investigation. But in the case of uh, my chapter on Carlo, I'm writing, um, you know, three pages worth and reprinting or five, you know, eight pages of text and reprinting 10 cartoons. In that case, you know, I don't think I'm under any obligation to find the cartoons that are most offensive to contemporary sensibilities. I think that actually presents a kind of barrier to the reader appreciating this work from a very different historical period. I think that's a prudent editorial decision. In my case, though, where we're talking about educate, uh, comics being used to educate and how comics can teach us many things, including you know, the stereotypes or caricatures sure. at the time that was acceptable. So I think context is important. And, and yeah, if you've got you know, five pages to turn somebody on to a comic, I don't think artist, I don't think you want to necessarily show them at their lowest point. Um, I, I can certainly see where that might be considered sensationalistic or unnecessary. Yeah. That, that, that kind of is a little bit of a bridge. Uh, Richie meant, Richard mentioned the, the warts and all thing. And I was just thinking about uh, Kent's book. Uh, a lot of that book is it's not a really, it's not really a promoting something, but uh, it's talking about uh, current works and talking about current cartoonists rather than kind of a historical overview, except for kind of the review essays that are in there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I was wondering, if, uh, since a lot of those uh, profiles were actually written by you as well, uh, what was your, what are your criteria for choosing who you're going to cover in those in those stories in in those profiles? That is a great question. Uh, about uh, let's see, in 2003, the editors of New Politics, which is a you know small left wing journal, started in the early 60s. Um, they approached me and said, "Would you like to do a regular column on cartooning?" And uh, the journal only comes out twice a year. And I know that somebody on the editorial board was 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 doubtful thinking that there wasn't enough material (laughs) and so i've done uh two a year since 2003 and put together this little book with 29 chapters and i have to say they've been great um you know it's given me a kind of a, a platform to uh spotlight people i like books that are interesting uh there is of course much more material than i could possibly cover the only real uh, guideline is that the focus of the book is on left-wing cartooning. And I have to say, having worked on left-wing cartooning for a long time, I am curious about you know conservative and libertarian cartooning. I once asked Peter Bagg if he'd be interested in editing a book on libertarian cartooning or kind of best of, and he said no. He thought that was a terrible idea that <laughs> all his favorite cartoonists are left-wing apart from himself, basically. He said. Um, but, um, you know, there's been this just fantastic way in which, um, you know, the deadline will, uh, will loom, right? Because I have a kind of a November 1st deadline and a March 15th deadline. And I'll just look around and say, you know, is there somebody I want to interview? Um, and the other thing I really appreciate this is that they've allowed me to, to do more humor than maybe they themselves would be interested in. So I started... Uh, not with somebody like, um, you know, a more somebody who's known for political, but the very first cartoonist I uh, profiled was uh, Reuben Bowling, who I think um, is uh, remains kind of underrated as a political cartoonist. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about uh, Reuben or Ken Fisher uh, when I was thinking about this podcast, because in a way, I think that some of the only really strong cartooning coming out of this current election is by by people like. Ruben Bowling. Um, I think some of the newspaper cartooning we're seeing in this election is really mediocre. You mean the current uh, political? Yeah. Cartoon. I mean, Tom Tools in the Washington Post mm-hmm. has been great. But, um, you know, I don't think this I don't think this election has produced a lot of great cartooning. I realize I'm kind of switching topics here, but <laughs> but it was fun to start a project on left wing cartooning by starting with Ruben Bowling rather than somebody more obvious. Now you would think again on this topic of uh, you know the the current con- uh, political moment um, that with a figure like Donald Trump and I'm not talking about his personality I- I'm talking about his physical appearance because he strikes me as someone like a Richard Nixon who is so easy to caricature that there would be more meat there now I mean I read political current political cartoons here or there but I don't I guess do it in a more concerted way that apparently you do Kent. Um, 
do you can't or, or everyone here feel that you know there is this kind of um i don't know lack of uh enthusiasm or lack of engagement with uh the you know our current political year oh i don't know about that look at gary trudeau's stuff on trump i think it's very uh very sharp and i think it's an outlier though do you uh-huh yeah Interestingly enough, I have in front of me right now a book that my wife gave me for my birthday, huge, uh, that, you know, the, collecting the 30 years of uh, Trump in Doonesbury. So mm. quite appropriate. But, uh, yeah, you would think that there would be more out there with that because he's so easy to, to caricature physically but also uh, emotionally, psychologically as well. But aren't newspapers uh, afraid of the bite of the caricature or cartoon? And, and there's this push to be more even-handed or even-keeled, I think, that maybe – has uh, dampened some of the satire? I, I'm just taking a guess. I have to say, um, uh, an hour ago, thinking about this podcast, I went through Google Images and just looked at a lot of both Trump and Clinton cartoons. And there is a whole um, group of cartoonists who seem to think that it's sufficient to find a kind of clever way to, to caricature one or both of them. So that if you have the, the big hair and the small hands – that you've got your cartoon and then, you know, the, the rest of it sort of just follows from that. Um, a few months back, I wrote a piece about um, the cartoons of Brexit in England, mm -hmm. and I'm really struck by the gap in quality between people like Peter Brooks or Steve Bell, who, who draw for the Times and the Guardian, and the equivalent um, in the United States, the kind of daily cartoonist. Uh, I'm not thinking so much of the comic strip people like uh, uh, Gary Trudeau. And, you know, I wonder how, to, to my mind, I, I wonder how much it has to do with um, newspaper owners and, and editors and um, a greater tolerance in some countries for a more vicious kind of visual satire than we have here. Uh, but I don't think there's anybody... Uh, on a, in a daily paper doing the kind of quality work that Martin Rosen, Steve Bell, uh, Matt, uh, even Mac at the uh, Daily Mail, I, I don't think the Americans hold up in comparison. I can compare to Sweden and, and here the big uh, time for, for political cartoons was in the 50s, 60s and the 70s. Since then it's gone downhill. And that's mostly because of the newspapers not being interested. I mean, we have great cartoonists here, but, but uh, they don't get work, in, especially not daily work, which is, I think, needed if you're supposed to work your way to, to a real proficiency in doing that well. So I'd, I'd say it's, it's the, the newspapers who are to blame here for the lack of, of, of good political cartoons. Well, so you know, a much smaller market here than it used to be. Yeah. Well, you know, with with this current political season, as as much as it's produced headaches, one good thing has come out of this, especially in terms of comics, and that is Burke Breathitt is back. <laughs> <laughs> True, indeed. Yeah. Now, you know, we were talking about, and I think it was Richard who said something a moment ago, uh, speculating that you know perhaps newspapers or other kind of publications that put out political cartoons may be a little antsy or a little worried about any kind of repercussions uh, from the satirized subject so have have any of you in compiling any of your books uh, heard any kind of resistance or pushback from either cartoonists or figures that Who's you know cartoons that you've compiled, or from their estates, or people associated with them, their publishers? Like, why did you do what you do, or were unhappy with the way that you represented, you know, this collection, or something of the sort? I haven't had that experience. My fear is that with newspaper cartoons, there's a lot of what you might call pre-censorship. You know, Ted Rawl tells this story. He's probably told it quite a few times where he was interviewing to be hired as a uh, uh, you know, staff cartoonist for a small paper, daily paper. And the editor said, now if we hired you, could you guarantee that nobody would ever protest in front of my office? And Ted Rawl, of course, said, well, I can guarantee that people would protest in front of your office. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard him tell that story also, yeah. I wonder if I could raise a related um, question, that is self-censorship. And the reason I say it is this. 
um, as a kind of an offshoot from my research on cartoons about the Holocaust, I have in the last few months been looking for cartoons, political cartoons related to the internment of the Japanese Americans. And um, I have found a I found cartoons justifying and defending the internment and often in racist terms. Um, I have not yet found a single political cartoon in an American newspaper criticizing the internment of the Japanese Americans. And it may be out there. I haven't, you know, I'm, the research is still a work in progress, but I, I have not found one. I've corresponded with others who are familiar with this work who do not know of any. And it has occurred to me that I wonder if some cartoonists who privately were upset about, you know, the internment of all these innocent people were nevertheless intimidated by the whole World War II atmosphere and and chose not to comment on it for fear of very adverse reaction. That's an interesting question. I can question. point you toward one exception, but again, it's a uh, it's fairly obscure. Uh, for about 15 years, a woman named Laura Gray, whose real name was Laura Slobe, did uh, cartoons for the weekly newspaper The Militant. And all of her originals ended up at Tamamen, which is a part of the NYU library system. And unless I'm mistaken, my memory is telling me that she drew some anti-internment cartoons. Okay, that's very interesting. I'm going to look into that. But of course, as a historian, I'm somewhat more interested in the mainstream press, because of that's course. where that's where public opinion might have been affected to the extent of of maybe changing President Roosevelt's mind or doing something. But I, I'm not surprised to hear that, by the way, because similarly in in research about cartoons and the Holocaust, um, I found some of the, the strongest cartoons in the American communist press, where they obviously were you know in, like like on, on all issues, they tended to to go at everything with you know no holds barred. Also, the communists had some really – American Communist Party had some really good cartoonists in the 30s and 40s. Yes. And the Daily Worker, of course, ran not one but two comic strips for a while. Mm -hmm. I realized I have a story about someone uh, being opposed to, to me publishing things. But that was after the book was published. Uh, that was, the again, the Black Images book. Um, when writing that, I was – um, I was a lurker at a discussion group, uh, email discussion group. This is this is still the '90s <laughs> about blacks in, in in comics, and I was just a lurker trying to get inspiration. Um, and then my book came out, and I thought, well, this is a good place to see what do they think about the book. And then after a month or two, and, and no one had mentioned it. And this is a group where they discuss the festivals and who's going there and what are, what books are being published and stuff like that. It wasn't mentioned. So I just put out a, a message saying, I'm, I'm a lurker, I did this book, and, and have you read it, and did you like it? And it turned out that the sort of the king of that discussion group was, was Dwayne McDuffie, uh, whom nobody opposed. And he, he went out and said, well, you know, we've seen it, and for you, this might be new things, but for us, this is all old stuff, implying that I shouldn't have done the book because, you know, I'm not black. And I answered him very politely, saying that that's that's interesting because then you're the first American comics historian that I've come across that have read loads of, of comics from, from Asia, from Africa, from Europe, from Australia, which I included. Uh, so what, where do you come across those and what do you think about that? And no answer. And no one else dared enter the conversation, so it died <laughs> long time ago. Oh, well. That's, that's rough. I'm just yeah. uh, just a, 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 a weird uh, tangent on the Japanese internment stuff. The first time I learned about the Japanese internment camps was from an issue of the Invaders comic book from the 1970s. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Where, where B B B Bucky has to uh, find a doctor and the, and, the, and the doctor that he needs is, is interned in a camp. And I was like, what kind of fiction is this? I've never heard of this because yeah. I never heard about it in school. Roof. So that, that kind of opened up a little bit of history that I had never heard through the official channels before in the pages of a comic book that had the Human Torch and Captain America and Prince Namer in it. So that Very was a, an odd thing. Well, I'll tell you, I'm now working on a project with Neil Adams and also with Craig Yeo that, um, that takes this, this exact same idea that comics are a way – comic books – are a way that American teenagers are sometimes introduced to subjects that are not being talked about in the classrooms. This is a book um, that IDW is going to publish next year, um, which we call We Spoke Out. 
um, how um, we're still working on the subtitle, but it's essentially how um, how comic book creators help teach American kids about the Holocaust, and the and the theme is that wow, in the seventies and earlier when Holocaust education was not a part of school curricula and when there was no big Holocaust museum in Washington and when there was no Schindler's List in the movie theaters. Back in those days, how did American teenagers learn about the Holocaust? So here you're mentioning you first learned about the Japanese internment through through a comic book. Well, um, the argument or the theme of this book is that um, for some American teenagers, they were learning about it in mainstream American comic books, which occasionally – brought the Holocaust into their storyline. So the book, this book, We Spoke Out, is a collection of those published comic strips uh, pre-1980 that had Holocaust-related themes. So there's a, there's like, like the Batman story, Night of the Reaper, of course. And, right. Uh, if you go, and going all the way back to the 50s, um, there's, there's, we have a couple of, uh, you know, classic EC stories. But, but it's the same idea that we might not have heard about it um, in our ninth grade social studies class, but when we got to the corner drugstore and pulled that comic book off the spin rack, suddenly, suddenly this very important topic was introduced to us in a different way. And of course, I would say a more effective way than having um, a teacher hand us a textbook. Is Ragman part of this story or is he introduced after 1980? He's a yeah, he's a later he's a later creation, so he doesn't appear. But some of Joe Kubert's um, Kubert's war stories from the sixties and seventies are there because Joe brought the Holocaust into into a number of his stories. And we can expect this sometime next year, right? Um, the cover Neil has, has drawn a spectacular cover for it. I can already brag about that. Um, <laughs> the permissions are all lined up, and um, and IDW is going to publish it sometime in 2017. We may debut it at San Diego in 2017, or maybe at um, the New York Comic Con, or maybe both, depending on when the book is in hand. And you said that that's just a um, it's just an American focus on that one, right? It's about exactly. It's all American. It's American comic strips. And the argument is that this was in a this was an American phenomenon. That this is one way that that American teenagers learned about it. By the way, we have a forward by Stan Lee as well. Wow! Wow! You know, we, we've been talking a lot about uh, political cartoons, and I, I think that most people like me uh, may think of you know when we're talking about political comics, we're thinking about those one panel strips, things that you would see in newspapers and magazines. You know, but along with that, I want to touch on cartoons or comics that are more propaganda oriented or, or something that I guess we could label uh, as an example of propaganda. I think most people, it, my students definitely, tend to have a negative perception of propaganda, that it's always something negative that the other guy or the other side is trying to do. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, for instance, when I've taught film, I've used, you know, two 1938 films, uh, Reef Installs, Olympia, and then the U.S. documentary The River about the, you know, the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, just to show that you know, one is, yes, you know, the other guy uh, trying to show, of uh, you know, the, you know, the, the new Nazi Germany and what it can do. But then the other made at the same time is showing what can be done with, uh, you know, certain conservation practices with uh, the, the Mississippi River. So, um, so propaganda is not necessarily a bad thing, although most people see it as such. Now, I know that definitely with uh, your books, Fred and or Frederick, and, and then with Richard, uh, Government Issue, <coughs> you're specifically dealing with propaganda comics. And I'm wondering, um, what are your experiences in defining what is propaganda? Well, I did that in the preface of my book. And I was actually – my book was commissioned by a British publisher, and they <laughs> – uh, essentially wanted me to do a book about uh, American superheroes in the 40s punching Hitler on the nose. That was <laughs> what they asked about. Uh, and I said yes, and then I redefined their concept uh, to be about propaganda and then made chapters about sexuality and politics and religions and stuff like that. And they were scared shitless to start with when I told them. Uh, but to, to make the, the, the subject as, as broad as possible to make... Uh, make it possible for me to include all the things that I wanted to write about. 
uh, I chose a very broad definition of propaganda and, and specifically not going for the traditional propaganda is bad Second World War uh, definition. So, so I, I sort of tried to, to define it as, as using comics to, to influence someone. Very, very broad, very um, inclusive. And that was mostly for, for the book because I wanted to include all my favorite strange comics. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm interested in how comics can teach or cause a change in behavior. And absolutely, that doesn't mean that comics are, are propaganda is bad. But I think we often associate propaganda with falsehoods or lies mm-hmm. um, or tricking the gullible into, you know, in, into simple mantras or whatever. But, you know, integration or sociological propaganda uh, uh, is, is important and interesting to me. It uses myths. It tries to establish good behavior. You know, it's an, a gentle way of introducing a sort of ethic. You know, it penetrates our culture slowly, uh, you know, with the ideals of stabilizing uh, our social body. Um, hey, why not, right? Um, so, of course, what's interesting about that is mostly that sort of stuff is done to reinforce the status quo, whatever the lofty aims of, of that stuff is. You know, and all the work that goes into creating a comic book, when you see deliberate images or um, deliberate storylines... Um, uh, it becomes sort of, I don't want to say nefarious, but it becomes pretty obvious that it's mostly in, in keeping the, those in power, you know, in, in staying power. Well, I mean, the word propaganda was neutral before the Second World War, mostly neutral. Uh, and, and then the Nazis had the Ministry of Propaganda, and, and them being the villains, that was sort of the, 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 the way that propaganda turned into being a, a really bad thing for most people. But... Still, you can define it any way you want when you write a book. So, <laughs> yeah, I have to say, for myself, it's a word I've always tried to avoid because of the kind of you know meanings that people bring. Um, you know, I'm kind of interested in cartooning as as an act of intellectual history, uh, where people are making arguments. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm especially interested in cartoonists who have a kind of knack, a talent for um, expressing ideas using not just words and pictures, but the whole ensemble of, you know, symbols and icons and formal aspects that cartooning depends on. Um, and, you know, you might convince me that you could use the term propaganda in a neutral way or that it's a useful word. It's certainly obviously a useful word in talking about you know, things like German or Japanese wartime or even U.S. wartime cartooning. But, um, you know, if you're talking about contemporary political cartooning, um, the word propaganda really, I think, pushes a lot of readers in the direction of away from seeing cartooning as kind of uh, an intellectual and uh, creative act in the direction of seeing it as kind of mechanical and that you're making some argument on behalf of some larger institution. Um, and, you know, in a way I've always been interested in kind of, um, celebrating the, um, the, um, agency of cartoonists and, um, detaching them from, um, you know, um, some other interests that they're sometimes said to serve that I'm not saying that, propagandistic cartooning doesn't exist. It's just not the kind of cartooning I'm interested in. Kent, well, can I ask we, you a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, so the, what about memes? Um, those dank Bernie Sanders memes. Are, are those uh, single panel editorial cartoons? Maybe. I've never had an occasion to write about them. It's a good question. And clearly, if you think about the kind of digitalization of culture, you have to rethink our kind of traditional definitions of comics. That's for sure. Um, you know, it seems to me in this coming sort of period, collage is a lot more important than it once was. And, um, you know, um, we're no longer talking about a kind of art form where the hand drawn image is necessarily at the center of the uh, process. Cool. Sorry to interrupt. No, no. no. Just maybe just to open it up just a little bit more, even to, to Raphael as well. I was just kind of wondering. If you're looking at kind of from historical perspectives to now, uh, is it enough for a political cartoon to just point out an issue or is it important to offer some sort of solution or incite a specific response? Again, that kind of skirts us back to propaganda a little bit. But well, one of, the, 
Go yeah, ahead. One of, one of the things I've been looking at um, is how cartoonists in our own time are approaching issues of genocide. Because in the 1940s, it was the whole idea of, of mass murder on this scale was so new and foreign. Um, and of course, the Holocaust took place in the midst of a world war. So there were a lot of reasons why political cartoonists in America would not have been paying much attention to it. But when you get to the, let's say, the 1990s uh, and more recently, the genocides in our time um, have taken place um, not, uh, let's say we're talking about Darfur or Rwanda. Um, you didn't have the excuse that cartoonists didn't, uh, you know, uh, were distracted by other, by other issues. So mm-hmm. um, I've been very interested in looking at how cartoonists approach those issues. In other words, here they had an opportunity um, as individual artists, as creators, to uh, alert the public to something that was a burning issue right now, which actually there were, which actually could be affected or um, in some way if there was, you know, sufficient intervention from, let's say, the international community. Um, and there were a number of good cartoons, especially about Dar- about Darfur, of not much about Rwanda, but then then again, the Rwandan genocide um, took place over a very short period, just a couple of months. Darfur went on for years, mm-hmm. um, and there were many cartoons about it. Um, now, recently, um, the, the whole crisis in Syria, which I would not characterize as genocide, but nonetheless something that um, should attract the interests of cartoonists. Um, I think it has. It has. It has attracted. I've seen a lot of very powerful cartoons about Syria, and it's hard to say what impact they have. But when you study, you know, the, the phenomena, the factors that shape public opinion, um, I think cart- cartoons, even in this in in this era when when print newspapers are 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 going out of business and there are fewer political cartoonists working and so forth, it, it seems to me that that cartoons about genocide today still very much have the possibility of playing a role, let's say, playing a role in trying to galvanize public opinion, trying to get the public interested in in doing something. Well, you know, a couple of times you guys have mentioned um, recent technology, the Internet, uh, digital media, and I'm, I'm wondering – in the work that you're doing, I mean, obviously, digital communications and the Internet become uh, useful tools as, as researchers. Uh, but in your interest in studying political cartoons, political comics, um, have you noticed uh, in terms of, I don't know, uh, quality, quantity, uh, anything that digital technology, specifically the Internet, has brought us uh, in terms of political cartoons or or maybe even changed in some way, something that's significant that kind of marks our current moment? I would say digitalization, from my standpoint, points in two directions. On the one hand, we have such, you know, much better access to older print materials, and it's so much easier to distribute our own work and, um, you know, just the just just having something close to a research library at our fingertips is, is a phenomenal, um, you know, op- set of opportunities. On the other hand, I think that uh, a lot of work that's made through digital means, I'm thinking of uh, tablets and the kind of, um, you know, the memes and the and the collage type work that I'm thinking of, to my eye, is not nearly as beautiful as things that are hand drawn. Um, hand colored. And so I suspect or I fear that there will be a decline in the kind of, um, you know, beauty of uh, the 21st century cartoon. But on the other hand, our access to older traditions, to little corners of comics history is just phenomenally enhanced by the Internet. So like I say, I think it points in two different, two very different directions. Oh my God! I killed the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Actually, I mean, when I asked the question, one of the things I had in mind is not just what the internet brings us as, as researchers, uh, but also as, as producers. Uh, so, for instance, with with web comics, and I, I have, I, I'm doing more and more work with web comics, but not of the political variety. And so, in terms of 
web comics that are out there that have a more overt political edge to them. I'm just not as aware of those. Uh, but I do know that with web comics over the past number of years, people – I mean, I mean, this is how they're becoming established, right? So um, they can't get published by a bigger or, or even a smaller press, but they develop a following on the Internet and then have a particular cachet, right, that they can take to publishers or publishers <clears throat> then seek them out. And I'm wondering if there's something similar going on with more politically oriented cartoonists who use webcomics in that way. I mean, I'm not aware of any. I can say in Sweden, I've been running a uh, comic art school for about 20 years now. And uh, when we started out, internet publishing was, was uh, secondary. It, was, it wasn't a big thing. And nowadays, I have loads of, of students who have internet publishing as their main uh, interest. And this is where they build their um, audience. And then some of them aim for, for being published in in print, but but a lot of them uh, see publishing on the internet as the end product. Uh, but almost none uh, are doing political work. They're all doing uh, longer stories, serialized stories, stuff like that. So so very few are getting into it to to have a political idea or come across with with the political subjects like that. So not a, so not on the web and not in print either. There so much. Well, they're on the web. No, no, for, for, for in Sweden. I mean, for, have, the political have, stuff. Yeah, in Sweden, we have a few political cartoonists. Uh, like I said, we had the big, big eras in the 50s, 60s, and the 70s. Then there were old guys. Now it's uh, young women doing political cartoons in Sweden, uh, mostly from a feminist perspective. So those are the big ones that, that sell a lot and, and draw attention. And they're both on the web and, on, and in print media. Okay. Does anybody share my sense that it's harder to make beautiful work with digital materials than with uh, traditional artistic materials? Not necessarily, I would say. I mean, uh, at my school, we mostly teach making comics with, with traditional methods, but we do have tablets and stuff like that. And, and if you're good at it, uh, you can make beautiful comics with, with whatever tool uh, you use, I think. Theoretically, sure, but can you point me to many beautiful cartoonists, beautiful works of cartooning that are being made using digital means? Um, can't, well, a lot of them are. I, I'm not always sure, actually, if they're done digitally or not, because it's kind of hard to tell nowadays. It is. Yeah. Are we talking political comics or no, just generally? No, just comics in general. Oh. I can't tell you anyone doing political cartoons uh, digitally, no, I can't. Sorry. But does Emily Carroll do hers digitally? Um, I, I ben, just, ben, you know. ben, Ca ben Catcher's all digital. Sure. At this point. Okay. So all of Ben's uh, creations are digital. Yeah. Huh. I, I will say that as a, as a librarian um, who has a, a sort of mixed view of the internet in terms of how it's affected <laughs> students' as research habits. <laughs> And how they consume information. But, you know, part of my job is to shepherd online information as well. So what I do is I try to populate the web with these primary materials and make them available to others. What's unfortunate about digital comics or, say, if the military puts out something online, it's hard for me to include that in a curated collection because um, uh, without me having to download that file and then upload it onto my own server, so to say. Um, but furthermore, though... The Internet has made research easier, too, in terms of Michigan State University's collection is available through catalog, so you can search WorldCat. And while they don't necessarily digitize comics or send it through their interlibrary loan, you can at least know what exists or what what's out there. And I'm sure that Ohio State will have you know, curated digital collections online in the future, and, and if they don't, they ought to hire me to do that for them. <laughs> but um, but I, I think the future will be a little bit more exciting in terms of People trying to be more cognizant and aware and archiving some of these digital creations, right? Um, so they don't just fade away in ephemera, uh, and, as well as converting the analog and, and, and migrating them to the online world to make available for, uh, for, for researchers and consumers. Yeah, D born digital archiving is, is fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's sarcasm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned WorldCat, um, but 
what are maybe image specific databases that I mean all of you have utilized, but especially someone like you, Richard, in your capacity as a librarian? Uh, and I'm thinking of things like Flickr's The Commons. Um, are, are those mm-hmm. kind of resources useful in any way in seeking out uh, political cartoons? Oh, I, I, in my in my work, yes. Um, I, I remember having to use that Flickr pool to try to track down a rare comic book that the U.S. government put out in the '50s about Korea called Korea My Home. Um, Ethan Persoff, who runs the Comics with Problems site, um, even though he puts a little watermark on the bottom, that's been helpful in terms of being able to look at images online before I have to go onto Heritage or eBay or whatever or try to accumulate that way. Because that's something else about these sort of comics is these aren't the sort of things that you can get at your local comic shop that they typically have, you know, a bin for. Um, so tracking them down in, in any sort of digital way, uh, is greatly appreciated, even if it's just a snippet of, uh, of an image that you can compare later on or do a reverse Google image search for to sort of track down. But uh, anybody who puts anything and scans it and puts it in like the Grand Comics database or something like that, it's greatly appreciated. Well, how about the rest of you? What are some of the challenges that you faced uh, in compiling your collections and getting uh, comics that, you know, aren't available like they would be at local stores or even at, uh, you know, like mycomicshop.com? Well, for every book I do, I I buy extensively. Sometimes I spend more money buying comics than than I get for for writing the books. So (laughs) that's just building my library. But I've realized, you know, the last 10 years or so that, that digital availability of comics have grown exponentially and I sometimes feel that this huge library that I built privately is going to be uh, you know not useful uh, in, in well maybe not in a few years but uh, there's so much being put out on, on the internet that that's uh, you're going to be able to do comics research without having to accumulate uh, a vast library of your own, which is good because for for me, moving is almost impossible. So, I I like digital. I'm a print man myself. I mean, I spend a lot of time curating my collection, as it were. But I do find there are certain books on comics and you know popular culture in general that I just return to over and over again. So. I like to think, having moved several times, that I now have a collection that I can really use for my own research. Oh, don't get me wrong. I love books. It's just that <laughs> having, having access to things, uh, as soon as you think about it and you do a Google search and you find it online and you can read it within minutes, used to be that I had to order catalogs from America and then order the books if they were available from someone. And, and if I wanted five or six copy, five or six issues, uh, you had to buy them from two or three publishers or, or retailers and it took months and months, and nowadays I can get it within 30 seconds often. So, big difference. Of course, the danger there is that people whose work have not has not been uh, digitized are become increasingly hard to, you know, learn about. Well, you know, as a way of wrapping up, I, I wonder if each of you could tell us. Um, like a, a current project you're working on. And Raphael, we can start with you, and you can reiterate what you told us a little while ago about the Craig Yo Neil Adams project. Yes, the book is co-edited by uh, Neil Adams, Craig, and myself. It's called We Spoke Out, um, How Comics Creators Help Teach America About the Holocaust. And the the premise is that before um, the Holocaust was talked a lot, talked about, in in American society, in schools, and in the popular culture, back in those days, the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, American kids were learning about the Holocaust sometimes from comic books. And it's interesting to go back and find old issues of uh, Batman or, Mar- or Captain Marvel, that the Marvel um, incarnation of that in the 70s, and um, and find that that once in a while. And, and the X-Men um, as well, to find that once in a while they used a Holocaust-related themes in their storylines. Um, so the book will be out uh, sometime in 2017, and it, it's going to serve two purposes. On the one hand, it's kind of a badge of pride for the comics industry because it shows that comics creators were doing something when a lot of other people weren't doing it and talking about an important subject when 
Um, it wasn't being talked about very much. So that's that's one part of it. But the bigger part is that we hope it'll be used in schools and that that um, teachers will be able to take this book and introduce the Holocaust to teenagers by by having them read comic strips, uh, comic books. And that will be um, – that's something that – of course, when we were growing up, the idea of reading a comic book in class was something that would get you penalized, um, <laughs> expelled. Certainly not uh, – wouldn't be recommended reading. But fortunately, we live in an era when the the use of comics, the eff- effectiveness of comics as a teaching tool has now become widely recognized. And so this book we spoke out was going to sort of um, hopefully um, dovetail with that with that growing recognition that comics are – a um, not only an acceptable but actually a very effective and a good way to introduce teenagers to what is frankly a pretty pretty dark and difficult subject and I don't know when I was in high school the way they would talk about the Holocaust is they take one part of of a single social studies class and they showed us a film strip of um, of Allied troops liberating one of the death camps and so we saw you know piles of bodies and it's disturbing. Um, but it's, it's, it's such a limited, um, and superficial way to, to learn about the Holocaust. So hopefully the, the comic strips that will be collected in this book, we spoke out, will, will be able to, um, introduce the subject in a more serious and a comprehensive way, but also in a way that teenagers will find engaging. We'll, we'll make them want to read about it as opposed to feeling like they're being compelled by their teacher to read about it. Kent, are you still working on the, 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 that periodical series? Are you asking me? Yeah, 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 in New Politics? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll continue to do stuff with New Politics, um, but my main uh, focus uh, these days is a turn from uh, left-wing cartooning to, you know, uh, more revanchist cartooning. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a leave in the spring to start a project on The Punisher, <laughs> I have about 800 um, comics. Um, you know, he's appeared in a lot of stories, a lot of Marvel stories since the mid 70s. And I've also been going to see uh, as many sort of uh, crime and cop films from the 70s and early 80s that I possibly can, as well as watching them online. But I prefer to see them on the big screen. So at some point, hopefully, I'll have a manuscript, but it's very early now. And, um, you know, I'm a little nervous about jinxing it. Fingers crossed. <laughs> well, well, Frederick, I know you're working on your PhD <laughs> right now, but um, what uh, what's your next project? Well, actually, my PhD is my next project. I've, oh. I've done several books while while trying to do my PhD. So, so right now, I'm put all books on hold. Uh, <laughs> but my PhD is is relevant here because it's about how uh, Arabs and Muslims have been portrayed in comics. So I'm trying to look at that from various various angles. Uh, I've looked at how um, American superhero comics depicted um, Muslim and Arab heroes after 9/11. Uh, that was one of the articles I wrote. Uh, I've looked at the Egyptian and and uh, other Middle East um, publishers who have done superhero comics and tried to emulate the American genre. Uh, and right now I'm looking at uh, Persepolis by Satrapi uh, and how she's using the form of comics to, to communicate her idea of Iran and trying to uh, sort of negate the, the, the bad uh, image of Iran in, in the West. So various ways of, of entering that, that topic. Okay. Good luck with that. It's a, dissertation's always fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well... <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and Richard, you have a new project coming up. Uh, yeah, uh, Several Irons in the Fire, uh, 2017, a book coming out that I co-authored with my film professor when I was an undergraduate called A Brief History of Comic Book Movies uh, that Paul Grave McMillan is putting out. Uh, when Craig Yo is done with Raphael, he needs to turn his attention to my QP's project book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Craig knows everybody, and he's, he's doing such a great job for the history of comics, I think, in, in terms of putting everything out. Uh, that people may have neglected in lieu of superheroes. Um, and then otherwise, I'm managing editing an academic journal on comics in the classroom. Uh, 
Well, Richard, Frederick, uh, Raphael, and Kent, I want to thank all of you for taking the time and being part of this roundtable discussion on political cartoons and propaganda comics. Cheers from Nebraska. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Cheers. This was great. Thank you guys so much. That went really well. That was a that that went in places that I wasn't expecting, which is kind of what you want in a discussion like this, I think. Oh yeah, and I mean, there's certain things that I know you and I wanted to ask those guys, but I much prefer just letting things go and seeing where the conversation ends up. And to me, one of the biggest takeaways of this conversation is uh, some information we got from Richard, and that was the public domain issues surrounding both Woodsy and Smokey. <laughs> it's a uh, woodsy, woodsy Owl and Smokey Bear both uh, do f- did feature in there more than I was expecting. Yeah, and in fact that the government published uh, material on how to destroy Smokey Bear and Woodsy Owl costumes. Um, that surprised me. Yeah, and of course, of course, a big discussion on politics. That's our big takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> but no, everything was good. But that was just a little, a little, little extra bonus there. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was it was all fun. And again, we want to thank Raphael, Frederick, Richard, and Ken for taking the time and being a part of this discussion. And let us know what they're doing next too, because those all sound like interesting projects as well. Oh yeah, so definitely look forward to those books. And if you want to find great books like the ones these guys have produced, then you would do well to check out the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com, and you're going to find great deals every single month. November is no exception. And after you do get your comics there, then get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about this roundtable discussion. If you go to the website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message through SpeakPipe right online. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 4153266427. Or you can email us. We're two guys at comicsalternative.com. Or you can contact me directly at derek's at comicsalternative.com. And Gene, how can people get in touch with you? Amazingly enough, Gene at comicsalternative.com. Neat, huh? <laughs> you can find <laughs> us all over social media such as Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, and on iHeartRadio. And if you're an Android user, on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. It's all there. We're all up in your internets. That's right. And that's where we like to be. So definitely check back. We've got a lot of other shows in the days to come. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Gene. And don't forget to do your civic duty. Go out and vote. Better.